Hi everyone, Dave here for another episode of Let's Crack Zodiac. First of all, before we get started, I wanted to say thank you for everyone who's been watching and supporting these videos. And I really appreciate all the questions and comments and suggestions I've been getting. This is the third video in the series, and there are two other videos that I'll put links to in the description below. If you like these videos, you may also be interested in videos I've made about cryptology topics surrounding the Zodiac case. In 2015, I went to the Cryptologic History Symposium, which is run every two years by the NSA. My talk there is about how to test different ideas about how Zodiac ciphers could have been made. The second video is a talk I gave in 2017 at the same place. That one is about how to tell the difference between real and fake clues in the ciphers. The third talk was at the American Cryptogram Association meeting in 2018. That talk was about all the different things we know about the unsolved 340 character cipher. The links for all these videos are below in the description. Okay, back to today's topic. Today I wanted to talk about Zodiac's first cipher, known as the 408 or the three-part cipher. He mailed these to newspapers after he committed some of his first crimes. I get a lot of questions about this cipher. How was it made? What kind of cipher is it? Who solved it? What is the solution? Is the solution valid? Is it complete? Is there anything else we don't know about the solution? Are there still any secret messages hidden in this code that haven't been discovered yet? So let's dive into the story behind this cipher and see if it helps us understand his remaining unsolved ciphers. Friday, December 20th, 1968. High school students David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen park in the Lover's Lane section of Lake Herman Road near Benicia, California. They were on their first date. A man comes up to them and starts shooting into their car. He keeps shooting them as they try to escape the vehicle and they are both killed at the scene. Friday, July 4th, 1969. 22-year-old Darlene Farron and 19-year-old Michael Majot drive to the parking lot of Blue Rock Springs Park, only a few miles from the scene of the first attack. A car pulls in nearby, and a man comes up to them with a flashlight. They think the man is a police officer, but suddenly he starts shooting at them. Majot survives the attack, but Farron dies en route to the hospital. The killer phones the police and takes credit for this and the December attacks. Friday, August 1st, 1969. Three Bay Area newspapers, the Vallejo Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner receive nearly identical letters from the killer. In the letters, the killer takes credit for the first two attacks on the young couples and includes specific details about the crimes. Each letter includes one part of a three-part cipher. Each part has symbols arranged into 17 columns in eight rows. Altogether, they form a hidden message that is 408 symbols long. So the entire cipher is often called the 408, or Z408. The killer says the cipher contains his identity, and he demands that the newspapers print the cipher immediately, or else he'll go on a killing rampage. That day, the Vallejo Times Herald publishes their third of the cipher. They report that Vallejo Police Chief Jack Stilts was not satisfied that the letters were really written by the killer, since anyone in the public could have gotten details from the crime scenes. So he asks the killer to send more details. The paper also reports that the police plan to send the cipher to the Navy for examination. An FBI file later mentions that they sent it to the cryptographic unit of the U.S. Navy radio station on Skaggs Island near Vallejo. Saturday, August 2nd, 1969. The San Francisco Chronicle publishes their third of the cipher, and the Vallejo paper publishes the parts that went to the San Francisco Chronicle as well as the San Francisco Examiner and declares the cipher isn't solved yet. Sunday, August 3rd, 1969. The Vallejo paper reports police still have no solution to the coded notes, and an anonymous person called to say they think whoever devised the code has vast knowledge of surveying, nautical science, and marksmanship. The paper also reports that people are avoiding the two crime scenes. The San Francisco Examiner publishes their part of the cipher and reports the killer did not go on his killing rampage as promised. They also report of police phones being clogged by calls from people asking if the killer has been caught yet. Monday, August 4th, 1969. Until this day, the papers have been referring to the letter writer as the cipher killer. 
but a new letter is received by the San Francisco Chronicle. In the letter, he calls himself Zodiac, and as requested, gives more details about the attacks. He also taunts the police. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack it, they will have me. The paper reports Police Chief Jack Stiltz asked the FBI and the California Identification and Investigation Bureau to help solve the mystery. Stiltz also says a former Navy man skilled in code work has been working on the cipher, but there is no progress to report. There are also reports of a 25-year-old San Francisco State graduate student working as a bank messenger and night watchman who claims to have cracked part of the code. He says he feels the cipher is not a hoax. It's too complicated and requires too much effort to devise. He says, There is a definite link between the code sent to three newspapers. I have found that link. I also have isolated 18 symbols. This is a skillful code, perhaps one compiled with a computer. I believe it was set up by a man who really needs help. He is intelligent and imaginative, but I know kids in school who could do better. He says he linked various lines of each cipher with each other and thinks pieces of each part are supposed to form a three-level diagonal pattern. He says he found these pairs of symbols which are equals, which I assume means they stand for the same underlying letter in the hidden message. Later, when the cipher is actually solved, it'll turn out that only some of his guesses were right. Tuesday, August 5th, 1969. The Vallejo paper reports professional and amateur cryptographers are trying to use astrology to understand the cipher since the killer calls himself Zodiac and some of the cipher symbols seem to have origins in astrology and astronomy. For example, the dotted circle is the symbol for the sun. The circle with a plus or horizontal line represents the earth. Filled circle represents the new moon. Open circle represents full moon. The sign of Aries the ram appears to be inverted and barred. M could be interpreted as Scorpio and other symbols can be interpreted as notations on star and planet charts. The Vallejo Police Department hopes the FBI can help. The letters and cryptograms were turned over to the local FBI office the day before for forwarding to Quantico. The FBI is offering its special cryptography and identification sections which are fully computerized. However, the agent said it may take some time. Meanwhile, the San Francisco graduate student and amateur cryptographer reported on earlier plans to work all day on the cipher. He took a break because he needed sleep after working all night for eight hours on the cipher. Wednesday, August 6th, 1969. The San Francisco Examiner reports that they contacted military historian Ladislas Farago, who wrote The Broken Seal, a book about breaking the Japanese code during World War II. He said he hopes someone solves it before someone else is killed, and he recommended contacting Dr. Donald C.B. Marsh, one of the world's top experts in cryptography for assistance. Dr. Marsh was contacted, and he agreed to help. In Vallejo, the Times-Herald reports that the San Francisco graduate student has been making progress. He claims he's made so much progress that solutions would run into infinity, making those ciphers virtually meaningless. However, using an ancient Indian astrology book, he discovered a name linked to the cipher which he feels may be significant, but this name is not included in the report. He also says the handwriting seems different between the letters and the ciphers, so maybe the writer copied or traced the ciphers, or maybe there are two different writers. Meanwhile, police are still waiting on the FBI in Washington, D.C. to examine the codes and letters, and many people in the Bay Area are still working at breaking down the codes. Thursday, August 7th, 1969. The Vallejo Police Department report for the Majo and Farron shooting says they looked into a lead in Stockton, California. A husband and wife living there are former foster parents for a teenager who wrote cryptograms whenever he got upset and had a violent nature. The couple gave copies of the cryptograms and samples of the teen's handwriting to the police. They also said the teen's brother was killed in Vietnam and he was in Vallejo for a funeral around the time of the Majo and Farron attack. They said he was also given his brother's gun around the same time. I think this kid was eventually cleared as a suspect. Friday, August 8th, 1969. At 6.35 p.m., Vallejo police receive a call from George Murphy at the San Francisco Chronicle. He says he received a letter from Donald Harden, a 41-year-old history and economics teacher at North Salinas High School. He and his wife Betty saw the cipher in the Sunday papers, broke the code after about 20 hours of work, 
and sent worksheets to the Chronicle. Vallejo police go to San Francisco to pick up the worksheets from George Murphy, which show the coherent message the Hardens found. It had a few errors in it that were corrected over the next few days. Here's the message, including those corrections. I like killing people because it's so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It's even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and all I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. The message ends with a garbled section that doesn't make any sense. The Vallejo police call the Hardens, who say the message is an accurate deciphering of the cryptogram. The police agree, and their report says, the message checks out against itself in all respects. Saturday, August 9th, 1969. The Bay Area papers start reporting on the decipherment breakthrough by the Hardens. The cipher writer threatened to go on a killing rampage last weekend, but it never happened. The ciphers were sent to Navy cryptographers, but they didn't report any success. The ciphers were also sent to the FBI, but due to delays, the code-breaking unit in their laboratory didn't receive the ciphers until after the Hardens solved them. So the Hardens beat them to the punch. Donald Harden said he and his wife started working on the ciphers around 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, August 3rd. Donald had a boyhood interest in ciphers and was methodical about breaking them. He reportedly consulted Fletcher Pratt's book, Secret and Urgent, published in 1939. It is about the history of codes and ciphers and how to crack them. Betty relied more on intuition in figuring out what the killer might have said in his message. Based on his code-breaking knowledge and a process of elimination, Donald decided the message was probably a substitution cipher, where each letter of the message was replaced with a cipher symbol. Donald counted up the symbols. The backwards Q was the most frequent symbol. In normal substitution ciphers, this is often a clue that the symbol stands for E, because E is the most common letter in English. But the killer cipher is different. It uses 54 different symbols, which means some letters will have more than one symbol, since there are only 26 letters in English. In Fletcher Pratt's book, this is referred to as simple substitution with suppression of frequencies. It's also known as homophonic substitution, or substitution with variants. And it's a technique that has been used for around 600 years. It's meant to throw code breakers off track. Since the letter frequency clues are suppressed, Donald and Betty focused on double symbols they saw in the cipher, such as these two half-filled squares. They figured those two squares stand for the same underlying letter, so the squares might decode to doubled letters like AA, BB, or CC, and so on. But in the English language, some doubled letters are found more often than others. The Fletcher Pratt book shows that LL is the most common double. So they assigned L to the half-filled squares. Then they also assigned L to all the other half-filled squares in the message. There's another pair of solid squares that also might stand for LL. So they assigned L to all the solid squares. And now the partial decryption looks like this. Donald said they looked for four letter patterns which would fit with the word kill. So they might have been noticing these repeating patterns. If they plug in kill for those symbols, the partially solved cipher looks like this. Betty said her intuition led to progress on the cipher. I thought at first that it was the work of a crank, 
but then noted patterns in the first symbols and dashes, which indicated they definitely stated, I like killing. Filling out all those symbols reveals a bit more of the message. Solving the code was trial and error all the way through. We tried every combination backwards and forwards. They worked all day. Donald slept at night, but Betty stayed up and ate very little. Their daughter, Leslie, who was a young teenager at the time, said she was very scared by words coming out during their solve, such as kill, dangerous, animal. By soon after midnight on the morning of Thursday, August 7th, they had solved it. After about 20 hours of working on it off and on, they called the local paper and mailed in their solution, which was also sent to Vallejo Police Sergeant John Lynch for verification. The police are convinced that the cipher translation is accurate and the author is indeed the killer. After talking to Donald, Sergeant Lynch said, I'm convinced he has it solved. There is no doubt in my mind that this is a true translation of the cipher and that the murderer wrote it. You can almost check the cipher against itself. Donald talked about the killer's message. As you can see, his spelling is rather poor, and in some places he has made errors in the use of his own cipher. He said the gist of the writer's message was fairly clear despite the errors, but the message failed to contain the name of the writer as he had promised in his earlier letters. Lynch wonders about the end of the cipher, which remains garbled. I think perhaps the man's name is in the cryptogram, possibly in the last four words. Betty said she thought the writer was either drunk or in a trance. The line is completely impossible unless the symbols mean complete words. The papers called Donald an amateur cryptographer, but he modestly rejected the title, feeling that while he enjoyed puzzles, he wouldn't even call himself an amateur codebreaker. The cipher just intrigued me. I saw some good coming if we could solve it, but I never do regular magazine or newspaper cryptogram puzzles for enjoyment. It seems a lot of work for nothing. After the Hardens submitted their solution, they decided Donald would deal with the press, while Betty was adamant about not being photographed. Unfortunately, this began to create the impression that Donald was the sole credit for the solution. But it was their teamwork that led to their success. Sunday, August 10th, 1969. Vallejo police receive a call from a San Francisco man who deciphered the garbled part of the 408 as the tip. I'm Robert E. 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 The man believes the four E's might stand for a name such as Fourese or Fouries. He might have seen the garbled section printed with the solution in the San Francisco Examiner the day before. Here are the letters as scrabble tiles. It looks like he rearranged the letters like this. Meanwhile, local papers report more details about the Hardens' success at cracking the code. The Vallejo paper reports that Donald gave his wife, Betty, much of the credit for decoding the killer's message. Betty said, I don't have any education beyond high school, but I make a hobby of graphology, and I think you could say I'm very tenacious. When I got into this, I just wouldn't quit. Donald would later become weary of all the press attention. Donald also had a few things to say about the killer. I don't think the author is a man of very high intelligence because there is no continuity, no fidelity in his code. I think he may have borrowed from a not too high level of detective story. There are no special characters in these cryptograms. They're just something he dreamed up. He also thinks the killer is middle-aged because of his use of the old-fashioned phrase, get the rocks off which Hardin thinks is not in common use by the current generation of youngsters. The end of the message is still garbled, and the Hardens promise to keep working on it with the hope that the killer's identity might still be hidden in there. The Hardens also spoke with John Lynch of the Vallejo Police Department and asked for a copy of the letter that was mailed with the ciphers. Lynch said the Hardens want to examine the letter to help explain parts of the message they cracked. The Vallejo Police are not the only ones convinced that the Hardens' solution is correct. Dr. Donald C.B. Marsh, a mathematics professor and head of the American Cryptogram Association, also confirmed and praised the code-breaking effort by the Hardens. He said the code is complicated and obviously drawn by somebody familiar with the ciphers, but there are also signs the writer is an amateur. For example, a professional cryptographer would probably have used a numerical code instead of symbols, which gives the writer more flexibility in the code. 
He also made amateur mistakes in the encipherment. And even though the extra symbols and lack of spaces between words made the cipher harder to break, it wouldn't take an expert to apply those ideas to the cipher. Dr. Marsh also pointed out that the three portions of the cipher used the same symbols, which was a clue that all three parts used the same method of encipherment. Dr. Marsh has been a cipher enthusiast since he was 10 years old, and he's been a member of the American Cryptogram Association for decades. This organization of code-breaking enthusiasts celebrates the hobby and art of breaking ciphers and releases a publication every two months called The Cryptogram. Their November-December issue included Zodiac's ciphers and a summary of the story surrounding them. The San Francisco Examiner contacted Dr. Marsh on August 5th to ask for his help with the ciphers. Dr. Marsh agreed. Copies of the ciphers reached me by mail a few days later, and I began a study of them, which was shortly interrupted by another telephone call from San Francisco, stating that Donald Harden of Salinas had reported solving the ciphers, saying that the message began, I like killing people. I was asked whether or not I could verify his solution. With this lead given me, I was able to recover the message within an hour, arriving at the same solution as Mr. Harden. Like Harden and the police, Dr. Marsh believes the garbled section at the end might contain clues to the killer's identity. Monday, August 11th, 1969. Vallejo Police Sergeant John Lynch receives an anonymous letter postmarked from San Francisco. It comes with a card that contains a key which the writer thinks will help in connection with the Zodiac's cipher letter. Dear Sergeant Lynch, I hope the enclosed key will prove to be beneficial to you in connection with the cipher letter writer. Working puzzles, cryptograms, and word puzzles is one of my pleasures. Please forgive the absence of my signature or name, as I do not wish to have my name in the papers, and it could be mentioned by a slip of the tongue. With best wishes, Concerned Citizen. The card came with the substitution key on a sheet of paper. It is the substitution table for the ciphers that appeared in the newspapers. The decoded message appears in the papers two days prior, but they only show the final message. This table of substitutions shows how to convert the symbols from the cipher message into plain text. On the right is a separate list of substitutions showing cipher symbols that have more than one plain text letter. In most cases, this is due to the errors the killer made when he created the cipher. Vallejo police sent the card and the substitution key to the FBI for analysis and to look for fingerprints. Tuesday, August 12, 1969. Local papers report on more efforts to find names among the garbled letters at the end of the solved cipher. Here's the garbled section, represented by Scrabble tiles. Several amateurs in the Bay Area, including Vallejo reporter Dave Peterson, rearranged the letters like this. They found that it looks like the name Robert Emmett the Hippie, but you have to cheat a little and add some missing letters, R, M, and P. Nevertheless, the codebreaker suggests letters may have been left out on purpose to make it harder to find his name. Vallejo Police Sergeant John Lynch says he's checking into people that might have the name Robert Emmett. An Irish revolutionary named Robert Emmett was executed in 1803 for trying to lead a rebellion against Great Britain. But Sergeant Lynch is also considering that Robert Emmett might not be the cipher writer's real name, or that it might still just be a jumble. The garble might be just that, a garble, to try and throw us off track. After all, it says in the cipher, I will not give you my name. Robert Graysmith says in his book that other people in the Bay Area came up with some other possible names. Emmett O. Wright, Robert Hemphill, Van M. Blackman, I. M. O. Wright, Kenneth O. Wright, Leo Blackman, F. L. Boone, and even a place called San Benito Mental Hospital, but apparently no such place exists. Graysmith doesn't explain how these names were found, but he mentions one name that can be found, and it doesn't rely on adding or removing letters. Here's the garbled section again. It can be rearranged like this to spell Timothy E. Fiebert. I don't think a person with this unusually spelled name has ever been found. Graysmith also suggests the killer may have gotten part of his substitution key from David Kahn's book, The Code Breakers, which was published in 1967. He says Zodiac used some of the assignments in this sample key from the book, but there are actually only a few matches, so it's a weak connection. 
Graysmith also thinks the killer was inspired by the Zodiac Alphabet from John Laffin's book, Codes and Ciphers. But this too is a weak connection because it only superficially resembles the killer's cipher alphabet. Meanwhile, Dr. Donald C.B. Marsh sent Vallejo police a list of Bay Area members of the American Cryptogram Association to check for possible suspects. Vallejo police also received an anonymous letter that says the last 18 letters could be a telephone number with one digit missing. The number is 632124. I'm not sure how the number was derived from the cipher. The police checked the Vallejo directory, but no such number could be found. They also got a call from a woman who saw how the cipher letter was signed and said her ex-husband signed some of the letters he wrote with a similar circle and crosshairs symbol. Wednesday, August 13, 1969. Vallejo police receive a letter from a San Francisco woman who deciphered the garbled section as, Before I meet them, I pity them. Let's see how that may have been found. Here's the garbled section again. We can rearrange the letters like this. There are a lot of letters missing. We have to add a T, M, Y, E, F, and M. I don't think this is very convincing, since many other rearrangements are possible, even if you don't allow mistakes. For example, here's the garbled section again. With just those letters, we can rearrange them to find the eerie poet bit him. Be here, tiptoe, tie him. I'm Peter, I bite the hoe. Bite hope either time. I hit the beer epitome. I'm here to bite the pie. But so far, most of the proposed solutions that were reported allow for some mistakes. So let's allow some mistakes too. Here are a few I discovered that only need one letter to be changed. I hope I'd better get him. I hope it's the beer time. I time the other piece. If you allow two changes, you can make Be there to meet Phil. Heir to the Tide Empire. Better hope I hide it. Allowing three changes allows you to find some creepy phrases like But I hope neither die. Kept him there to die. To help them die there. Those are just the tip of the iceberg. Many thousands more are possible. If one of those just happened to be the correct answer, how would we even know? Donald Hardin spoke with the Vallejo Times Herald about the findings of names in the garbled part of the cipher. From the standpoint of a cryptographer, all I could say is that I'd have to adhere to the theory that the last line of the cryptograms is merely filler. If the last line is an attempt to say something more, then you have to twist the cipher. If it's an attempt to say more, then he certainly has not followed his cipher pattern. I wouldn't rule it out, however, because no one can say for sure. He says he thinks the last line was used simply to fill out the third section to make it the same size as the other two parts. I think anything else is merely speculation and not really cryptology. It can't be substantiated under cryptographic methods. When asked to speculate about the killer's motives, he said modestly, I'll leave that to the psychiatrist. After all, I'm not even a cryptographer. Tuesday, August 19th, 1969. Reports in the FBI's Zodiac case files detail their analysis of the killer's letters and ciphers. They tried searching through their anonymous letter file to see if there were any matches to other letters sent over the years, but they found no match and added the killer's letters to the growing collection. They did find the Fifth Avenue watermark on the letters.
the watermark is used by the F.W. Woolworth Company. The FBI looked for any signs of indented writing, where writing from another page might press through into the papers used by the letter writer. Such writing would be a very useful clue about the writer, but they didn't find any indentations. The FBI says the overall message is encrypted with what they call a uniliteral substitution crypto system with variants. Uniliteral just means the clear text letters are replaced with individual symbols, like this. This is in contrast to multiliteral, which means the letters are replaced with groups of symbols, like this. The FBI also calls the cipher a substitution cryptosystem with variants. This is basically a simple substitution cipher, but with a twist. Let's start with an example of a simple substitution cipher. Take Zodiac's plain text message. To make it into a simple substitution cipher, we replace each letter by only one cipher symbol. For example, every E is replaced by Z. Every I is replaced by P. Every T by H. Do this simple replacement for every letter and we get this cipher text. Now, if we count up the symbols in our simple substitution cipher, we get these counts. Z is at the top of our list. And we know that the letter E is the most common letter in English. So this is a good clue that Z in this cipher probably represents E. But the FBI says Zodiac used a substitution crypto system with variants, which is also known as homophonic substitution. It means that he used more than one cipher symbol for each letter. For example, instead of just using Z to stand for E, he used these seven different symbols. I is replaced by these four symbols instead of just P. T is replaced by these four symbols instead of just H. And so on for the rest of the key. Now when we count up the symbols, we get these counts. Now, the half-filled square has the highest count, but it doesn't stand for E in this message. It actually stands for L. So, this trick makes it a bit harder to figure out which letters the symbols stand for. There is another clue in the cipher that points to the symbols that stand for the letter E. Here is Zodiac's plain text. Let's look at all the E's. Here are the symbols he used to replace the E's, and the rest of the symbols for all the other letters. Now let's write down all the symbols for E in the same order as they appear in his cipher. There's a very noticeable repeating sequence. It shows that the killer had a systematic method for assigning the different symbols for the letter E. He used the same method for several other letters, so those patterns can be found too. These patterns are sometimes known as cycles, and they can also be found in Zodiac's unsolved 340 character cipher. Another FBI report contains their analysis of the concerned citizen card that came with the substitution table for the cipher. They did not find any watermarks or indented writing to help identify the source. They did notice many defects in the typewriting on the envelope and card, which can be useful in figuring out what kind of typewriter was used but there isn't enough typewriting on the card for this method to be accurate. As far as I know, nobody ever found out who made this key. The FBI also performed cryptanalysis of the key. Here are the results. They conclude that it is a substantially accurate key to decrypt the previously submitted ciphers. The substitution table consists of equivalents for QC7, 11, and 15. QC7, 11, and 15 are the FBI's internal designations for the cipher documents. By equivalence, they basically mean that each cipher symbol stands for a plaintext letter. Column 1 is P-C, which means it translates plaintext to ciphertext. Column 2 is C-P, which means it translates ciphertext to plaintext. 
Continuing their analysis, the FBI points out a few mistakes in the key. This plain text X should be backwards J, not the regular J, because all the regular J's stand for F. Plain text F should be regular Q, not backwards Q. K and L are not verifiable. These assignments simply don't make any sense. These other assignments also don't make any sense. Cipher A stands for plain text N, Cipher I stands for plain text O, and Cipher L stands for plain text L. Some of them can be explained by some interesting encipherment mistakes in the cipher that seem to come from the killer getting confused about his own symbols. For example, look at this piece of the cipher. Based on the known key, this decodes as danger to. But the killer was trying to write dangerous. In the other parts of the cipher, the letter O is replaced by this other I-shaped symbol. So if you fix the symbol, it now decodes as danger rule. We can make one more fix. In other parts of the cipher, the letter S is replaced by the symbol F. And an F could be mistaken for an E. So if you fix the symbol, it now decodes as dangerous, the correct spelling. He also seems to have gotten confused about triangle symbols. For example, take a look at this section. It decodes as S-L-O-I. But the killer was trying to write slow. If you look at the next word, it is down. And the W is represented by the A symbol. The letter A is shaped kind of like a triangle. So if you replace the triangle here with an A, the word slow is decoded correctly. Despite this handful of errors, people were still able to solve the cipher. So at this point, there are multiple confirmations of the hardness of solution. The Vallejo Police Department, American Cryptogram Association President Dr. Marsh, and the FBI lab. You can verify the solution for yourself too by applying the substitution key to the ciphertext. You just read the cipher and replace each symbol with its assigned letter from the key, like this. The resulting message is long, easily readable despite a small number of mistakes, and doesn't have to be forced using many steps. But the garbled section at the end is still a mystery. Does it still hide a secret message? Many names and phrases have been produced, but there is no good way to test which one might be right. But maybe it's just junk, used as filler. Without that section, the third part would be a different size than the other two, making it more obvious that it's the last part of the cipher. There are also many symbols in the garbled section that repeat in the same columns from above in the cipher. So maybe the filler was made just by copying random symbols. Or maybe the garbled section has some connection to the ciphers Zodiac would send later. So even though Zodiac's first cipher is considered solved, there is still this small mystery surrounding it. So Zodiac's first letters to the newspapers were very unique and made a big impact. He was able to force the newspapers to publish his ciphers, and he got a lot of people really scared about what he was going to do next. He created a lot of fear in the Bay Area, and he inspired a lot of regular people to try to solve his cipher. Eventually the Hardens were able to solve his ciphers, and that gave a lot of regular people hope that maybe one day his other ciphers could also be solved. The Hardens did an amazing job of rising to the challenge of solving these ciphers. That has given a lot of people hope that an ordinary person might one day be able to solve Zodiac's unsolved ciphers. Thank you for watching another episode of Let's Crack Zodiac. Please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications, leave comments, questions, and suggestions below. I enjoy reading your comments and emails. If you'd like me to take a look at a proposed solution to a cipher, I'd be happy to take a look at that. And stay tuned for more episodes. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.